Hi there, this is, Hen this is Henry Kreuter, and I'm taking you back to the beginning of the 20th century. Why do we want to take you back to that lovely period? Well, for some people, it wasn't very lovely. And in this beautiful movie, which was 1939, the same year of The Wizard of Oz, Withering Heights and Gone with the Wind, this is Greta Garbo. They called it Garbo Smiles. This is Ninochka, where she plays a special envoy from the communists to go over to Paris in, uh, in that era and reprimand three people. They were named Bulyanov, Ironov, and Kopalski. This was a beautiful movie. It's my favorite all-time movie because it takes place in Paris, La Ville Lumière, the city of lights, and La Ville d'Amour, the city of love. So what happens to Ninochka is she goes back to her area in I think it might be Moscow, but she goes back in the 1930s to the depravity of communist Russia. And when she gets there, you see how she lives. Even though she's got a good government job, she's relegated to one A. And so when she has a party with her three friends, the Bulyanov, Ironov, and Kapalsky, they have to each bring their egg over so she can cook an omelet for them. So this is the life that, that people had to deal with back in that time. And the author, Ayn Rand, had a similar life, but she had an even worse life because she was facing problems of two, two revolutions, the Kerensky revolution and the, um, the overthrow, the Cossacks and the, help me out, Mr. C, the communists and... Uh, the easier way is white Russians. The, yeah, the white Russians. Who were the poor people? The Bolsheviks, yes. The yeah, the Bolsheviks, Bolsheviks the white Russians, and, and the Leninists. So this is what Ayn Rand left. And she was an educated person, but her young life was through these two revolutions. And that sets the context for her later works that deal with a new philosophy. She saw one, which was the communist with a dictator. It wasn't pure communism, like many of the philosophers had talked about. It was dictatorship. And then Stalin, of course, from the 1920s onward, was taking out his enemies, and thugs were going into universities, and they were just creating chaos. And this young woman had to deal with that through her young life. And when she went to the United States, she saw, and she knew before she got to the United States that there was gonna be chance of success and there was going to be freedom. And she made her way to California where she got into the movie business. Didn't have an easy time uh, being an extra, writing for movies, this type of thing. But eventually she became a best-selling author and when she became this best-selling author, she also became a spokesperson for her philosophy. And more objectivism. Um, and Correct. I misspoke. I misspoke. Um, objectivism, not collectivism. Yeah, because collectivism is about communism, big C. Correct. And, and before we even begin, I think that we, we absolutely need to be clear to those who are listening or watching or both uh, that there is only that when we talk about communism we have to be careful to be sure people understand we're talking about a, a political philosophy which is now with the exception of north korea uh and the and the quasi if you will democratic communism of china uh dead um even Cuba, which was a, a hangout for communists, uh, is now moving toward, uh, if you will, capitalism. Uh, small C communism, There's a, I learned this a long time ago in social studies class. Uh, small C communism is what happens in places like convents, uh, monasteries, and places like that. Uh, and it is the philosophy of from each according to their uh, capabilities and to each according to their needs. Now, the problem with, well, let's not get into the problem. Ayn Rand uh, came to this country in the early 20th century and led, um, even though she had a hard time at the beginning, if you go back and you look at her, her biographical data, you find out that she actually did very well. She married well. Uh, she married a man who had 
huge amounts of money by then standards, perhaps not by the standards of billionaires today, but it certainly led her to have a very comfortable life. And when you contrast that life that she fell into, and I use that phrase deliberately, uh, with the life that she uh, was born in, into which she was born in the Soviet Union, um, yeah, she was better off. Uh, now, I'm going to stop talking for a minute and let you go ahead and add some th thoughts. Cor correct. Okay, so born in St. Petersburg, Russia, 1905, the age of six, she taught herself to read. So Mr. C on the other line here was also an early reader and uh, engrossed himself in, in books at a very young age. The creation of the Soviet Union took place in 1922. There were, it was a, a revolt, you know, revolution is a revolt. And so if the, the key people have lots of wealth and times are tough, the masses, which you find uh, in this wonderful movie, Ninochka, they, they jokingly talk about, or not really jokingly, but they humbly talk about the masses. So the masses are important. You've got millions of people and they're starving. And if they don't have the grain, how do they get through the winter? Because they're, they're not living on farms. They're living in uh, urban areas and suburban areas where they're devoid of the lives that their, their grandparents had. And, and in, think of the Soviet Union in the, in the long six, seven month winter. Where are you gonna, where are you gonna find a cow that has m enough meat on them to feed millions of people? So this is the, the time that, that Ayn Rand grew up in. And she rebelled against the dictatorship, the control of thought, and she favored her objectivism over collectivism. I'll let you share a little bit, Mr. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, I read uh, Fountainhead and Atlas Shrugged when I was 18, 19 years old and, and new in the service in the Air Force. Uh, and like uh, Ayn Rand, I taught myself to read only a little earlier and with something a lot more fun, comic books. Uh, I needed, as I told you before, I needed to understand what was going on in the pictures. And to learn, to know that, you had to learn the words, you know, that were in the cartoon balloons. Um, Ayn Rand, again, uh, even though she was born into, into uh, poor circumstances in the Soviet Union, um, she took advantage of an opportunity to leave the country. And one of the things that I think is significant about that movie that you like so much, who's the director? Ernst Lubitsch. Um, would he happen to be a Russian Jew by any chance? It's quite possible. The, the As a matter of fact, he is. He is, As a yeah. matter of fact, he is. And you are aware of the pogroms against the Jews that were taking place under Marx and Lenin. You are aware of those. F fill me in in more detail. Okay, with the death of the Tsar and the death of the Tsar's family, um, for example, Rasputin was a Jew and had been a principal advisor of the imperial crown. Um, with the death of the Tsar and the Tsar's family and any successors, notwithstanding the legend about uh, the surviving child, uh, the Cossacks were turned loose on Jewish villages in the Russian steppes. Um, as far as Russia being able to feed itself, it actually had been very successful at that because its breadbasket, which is in the southern part of the country, uh, was quite fertile. And in fact, it was as fertile as the Midwest of the United States in its ability to provide the staple of the Russian diet, wheat. Uh, so what happens with these pogroms is there are many Jews who leave the country. Uh, Lutz, the director of that movie, of course, had a goal when he made the movie. What was, what do you suppose that is? A little critical thinking here. What do you suppose his goal was? Well, one of the obvious features is you show Paris in, in its full bloom. So you have people mm -hmm. wearing short sleeve shirts where the weather is, is still ice cold back in, in Moscow. 
and uh, and you contrast the freedom to start your own business, the freedom of ideas, the freedom to get drunk and and you know and have a party, the the freedom to be in this five star hotel, which is where part a good part of the movie takes place in Paris. So you're contrasting that with uh, the the Nanochko's apartment back in I believe it's Moscow. And and you and you you show that there's no it's hopeless basically you show hope versus hopelessness. Yes, you do, and and of course that is as as you will as you are aware um, later on under Joe McCarthy, uh, many people in Hollywood were accused of being uh, communist, big C, uh, and were brought before the Un-American Un Activities Committee and required to testify. And out of this, because of the fear of certain individuals in the Hollywood hierarchy, there was a blacklist created. Notably, Anne Ayn Rand was not called to testify before the House Un-American Activities Committee. Uh, and as you are aware from history, uh, a, fur, a very famous and well-known newsman uh, took on Joe McCarthy finally and asked him the question, have you no shame, sir? So when we look at the circumstances of that movie, it is a propaganda piece, and it is intended to show the failings of the Stalin, Stalinist version of communism. And we're not here to talk about communism per se, except as it had an influence on Ayn Rand and why she wrote the two books that she wrote, which have become uh, the darlings, if you will, of the alt-right in this country, uh, and this idea of objectivism. Uh, and at this point, I will say to you that in all of the philosophy books that I have, uh, there is no mention of that being a philosophy. There is no mention of Ayn Rand being a philosopher of significant note. Uh, I have a, a first year text. It's called Discovering Philosophy, and it is re a required reading of first year philosophy students who are taking a general survey course. Uh, and guess who's in there? Marx, Lenin, even a little Che Guevara, but notably Ayn Rand isn't. Oh, and guess who else is in there? Somebody who is likely a huge influence on Ayn Rand, Thomas Hobbes, the writer of the Leviathan. Now, if you read Leviathan first, and then you read Fountainhead and Atlas Shrugged, you begin to understand where Ayn Rand got her ideas, because this book, uh, by the way, are you a fan of the comic strip Calvin and Hobbes? I am. Yeah. Well, then you know, of course, that that uh, he is. He very clearly said that yes, his cartoon characters were were premised upon uh, Calvin and Hobbes. Now, Calvin, uh, being named after a very famous religious person in England, and Hobbes being named after this guy. Um, well, you read the two and then you understand where Ayn Rand get, gets her ideas. Because altruism, as defined in the Oxford English Comprehensive Dictionary, comes from the French and it means concern for the welfare of others. It is not a political philosophy. It is not intent, it just, are you concerned about the welfare of others? Do you take that concern to a degree where you are no longer concerned about your own well-being? No, you don't. Oh, uh, wait. So I'll, uh, I'll chime hang, hang on a second. Hang on a second. This is my attorney. I got to take it. Hang on a second. 